Okay. So thanks, Anna, firstly, for sending me this page that we're on here, this Dreamcatcher Botanicals. Um, I learned a few new things about a few plants. And I do want to say, you know, this is not my page. A friend just sent me this page. It's just someone's Facebook page. I don't really want to advertise it, but, you know, when something is good, it's worth sharing. And this guy does a pretty uh, reasonable job of, you know, putting together little blogs on certain plants. And right now I'm reading about Salvia elegans, as you can see, or Pineapple Sage. Now, remember recently I've done a video for Erica um, on Pineapple Sage. And before we move on, I will say if you donate to the $30 Bandit Food Plant Teaching Series, that doesn't mean I'm not going to delete you or block you. I had to delete and block Erica because she made a post in some group about um, giving a shit about what's happening with the royal family. When you pay attention to things and you give it energy, it doesn't, you know, stop it from happening. It does the opposite. So, you know, you're giving energy to it. So remember I've said in many of my videos, like the money video the other day in Veronica's video for the tincture tonics uh, in the $30 Bandit Food Plants teaching series, I said as well in that and in the money video I made just a philosophical money video in the Conscious Azeem playlist, I said, um, you know, every dollar you spend is a vote and you know every time you put your energy anywhere it's like a vote for the type of world you want to see so anyway this page just taught me that I can uh, smoke the pineapple sage for its relaxing quality so I just went ahead and did that <clears throat> before we talk about that because I'm under the influence right now and it feels pretty nice um, I deleted Erica and and you know, in my opinion, the the Queen is, you know, one of the biggest murderers in the world and they're, you know, they're part of the Black Alliance. I, I would almost call them psychopaths, but, you know, individually, you know, those, the, the boys, the boy kings there, they're, they're probably not psychopaths. They look, you know, like reasonable gentlemen or whatever you want to say. But um, when we look on the larger you know, scale of things, they are blocking the whole of humanity, um, you know, from abundance by maintaining this system, maintaining their hierarchy and etc. They are part of the Black Alliance because they, if they can't even see that, what I've just mentioned, then hence black or in the dark and hence part of the Black Alliance. And then when I have a friend giving energy to that, this Erica lady that I was friends with, you're part of that Black Alliance too, and I will not live with the enemy. I'm sick of living with the enemy. So I've had enough, I'm fed up, and I'll, I'll just block and delete people. I don't give a shit. Go do your own research then. Anyway, so thanks for donating today, um, uh, Jill, again. Awesome. I'm absolutely loving doing this series. Like I can see myself doing this for, I don't know, at least a decade. And the reason I say that that is because with my ADHD I get uh, bored quickly. <laughs> but I learn very quickly when I'm interested in things, I've noticed. And um, so I'm interested in things that are hard. If something's easy, I get bored with it real easy. <laughs> so, you know, this, this 350 sort of or so uh, larger families of, of the sort of greater plants on earth and you know if you know many of them you'll pretty much detach yourself from the matrix and be able to walk around in the environment and see edibility like the natives of the past of the historical period like the aboriginals of Australia or the, the shaman Amazons or whoever you'll be able to walk around and do wild fooding and the reason I'm so interested in all this is because there's so many uh, different plant families and so many different genuses and species of plants in those families. It's going to keep me interested for a while, I think. So thanks a lot for donating, Jill. Um, don't let me catch you talking about royals. <laughs> no, Erica had a bit of that in her and I, I didn't like that. Anyway, it's not my vibe. So anyway... 
moving past all that, and that's for another philosophical video where I would go in depth into that. Um, so I just found out you can smoke this uh, pineapple sage, which was the video I made for Erica. And um, so what happened? Well, uh, I had one joint. I quickly went and dried it before. I, you know, I ran out. I literally ran out into the garden in a frolicly frantic frolic <laughs> and you know uh, a bullion frolic into the garden and I've dried some quickly in the dehydrator <clears throat> just on 50 degrees just so it would sort of quickly do it uh, by the way I asked someone how do you dry your kale chips I think it was Cheryl and I'm not sure who it was out of you guys on my friend list I thought it was you Cheryl and um, uh, you were someone was saying that they dried their kale chips at something like 350 degrees and I'm not sure who it was actually um, and and uh, I said well what's the use you're gonna sort of kill off all the good stuff in there at 350 degrees at 10 minutes the, the whole idea of dehydration is to keep the constituents alive you know all the all the um, health beneficial properties alive in the leaf and so you dry things slowly, very slowly. Usually you don't want to heat them above 47 degrees and stuff like that. So look into that because that's not the way to dry things really quickly and at, an, at intense heat in the oven. You get yourself a dehydrator because mine was only $40, just a crappy dehydrator. And it works wonders. And again, it will make you be able to dry food. So when you're wild food foraging, and remember wild foods are very nutritionally dense quite often um, you know when you're wild fooding then you can go ahead and dry things out and dehydrate them and again this is going to detach you from dependence on this psychopathic death cult uh, black alliance system that we have in the world or the no alternative system so anyway the qualities that I'm feeling is a little bit of a tiny buzz but that might be because my body thinks that I've just smoked some cannabis because sometimes I smoke cannabis and I haven't had it for a little while now um, for a matter of days actually I did have some and um, you know my body is probably just thinking oh hold on it's not cannabis but hold on it might be and it's giving me a little bit of a sort of tingle so I need further experimentation on this because this is only the first joint of this pineapple sage I've had I just had one joint and so I felt cation uh, positive ion um, waves leave me through my third eye um, so there was like waves of light when I closed my eyes and they were like positive ionic uh, charge which is not good for us causes you know a range of major diseases and um, it's part of the whole you want to get grounded and get the cations off you or the positive charge and you want to get re-anionized well the anions are the negative charge and the earth when you stand on it barefoot will re-anionize you and give you that negative charge back and if you view the shamans of the Amazon video on the internet YouTube video I remember in that shaman video the shaman goes the guy asked the interviewer asked the uh, shaman how do you see pain in people and he said a bright like white light and for a while I didn't know I thought oh what how could white light be you know some negative thing and then I thought oh. then I found out about this whole negative and positive ion thing and I've been watching a lot of David Wolf on the longevity conference talks where he talks about the grounding and they've got grounding technology where you can get a grounded bed sheet now you can ground your car, all sorts of stuff. Um, so, um, then I realized I put two and two together or one and one together and I realized, ah, oh, he was seeing the positive charge on people. And that's how he was healing his clients, the shaman of the Amazon. So now I'm officially also a shaman. <laughs> Well, I actually am, but not just because of that. Anyway, so you can use um, pineapple sage as tincture for anxiety and nervous disorder, disorders, nausea, flus, colds, and fevers. And anyway, I, I like this smoke. It is relaxing. Um, 
I've got not really a buzz, the tiniest bit of that, you know, the tiniest little buzz. It's really minuscule, nothing to go on about. Um, and what that is, I think that buzz that I have always noticed from cannabis, which I'm noticing now, is the cations leaving, I suspect. And it is the reanionization. By the way, Jill and everybody listening, I just shot a video, Master Morning Healing, reanionization. And I just take you through a five hour sort of morning routine that I'll do on my sort of Sabbath day on a Sunday or something. You know, that's my church. I don't go to church to worship anyone but my body and uh, myself, really. Uh, making the body a temple sort of thing. So that's just something I'll do, you know, once a week. It involves surfing for many reasons, and which I did not expand on in the video, but I could. Uh, but I'll one day shoot a video on why surfing is so healthy for you. I'm currently on the all around health page in consciouszine.com um, making that post. I'm sort of, it's developing into a small book. <laughs> You know, because of things like vitamin D, um, reanionization, and other things. Anyway, so let's get back on track here. So I thought that was a cool little page. Thanks for showing me, uh, Anna Key. Anna Key, I also made a video for, and she's a member of Conscious Zine. Has her own page in Conscious Zine. She's an artist. And Anna, thanks for that. And I shot a video for Anna called Nanochloropsis gaditana which is a phytoplankton that we'll be eating in the future. We'll be seeing much more of in the health shop. And also in that video I talked about the anandamide bliss chemical creation from CNS arousal due to CBD from cannabis, if you're interested. Anyway, let's uh, go ahead and delve into this video. I started by looking into this one. So let's go ahead and, and look at the post I made. So we'll start here. What's going on? Okay, this is a back page of Conscious Zine. It's not the main front page. All the front pages connect to their own back pages. Where are we? Oh, what's going on? Here we go. The Your Natural Paradise back page. <clears throat> yeah, marijuana, safer than peanuts, yet illegal. <laughs> um, all right, let's go down to this post I made. I did want to turn this video into a uh, Australian bush tucker video, but there's too many on this page to fit in one video. So I'll make a separate video. So here's the post I just made just this morning and that I'm going to shoot this video on. Mainly surrounding pig face because, you know, I was just at the beach this morning. No surf, but I, I remember the other day the lady I'm living with, Sheridan, told me that you can eat this pink flower of that succulent on the beach. And I went, oh, I know the one you're talking about. So I've done a little bit of research. Turn, turns out it's called um, pig face. Carbobrotus glacusens, and actually you can eat those succulent leaves there and they taste a bit salty and they also have vitamin C as we'll cover in a second um, but you know it's not really going to be the best sort of food but it's a famine food and it's important to know famine foods foods in case martial law is instilled and uh, you know we don't have that in Australia but we'll, we might have something similar who knows you know, in case the system breaks down in, or something like that, or system collapse or something, in other words, it's always a good idea to have wild food knowledge, obviously. This is, a, this is the area where knowledge really is power, in my opinion, because it can keep you alive, <laughs> not just get you something. So this is a real area where knowledge is power, because it can actually even keep you alive and living, <laughs> and in good health, too. So Worth noting. Let's have a look into this. A beautiful little lorikeet there. Rainbow lorikeet. And I must say, Jill, you have a bit of rainbow lorikeet energy yourself, I think. 
it's funny, I remember for Amelie's video, uh, she's a redhead, and a little red-headed bird showed up. So, is this happening again today? Is what I was uh, insinuating. <laughs> hey, yeah, it's a really smart little lorikeet too. You can just tell by the way it sort of moves and looks at me. You know, I, I, I can't believe that there's still people who, you know, look down on animals. I mean, some of these animals are surviving better than them. <laughs> Just off wild food, you know. And the case of animals and animal cruelty, for me, all, all that comes down to, or has to boil down to, is the white scum when you boil down water. <laughs> now, what it boils down to is um, sense stored electrical waves, just like you, human. Look, she agrees with me. <laughs> oh, okay, so enough about uh, smoking herbs <laughs> and um, common food plants. That's amazing, I didn't know you could smoke the pineapple sage, that's cool. So, and enough about Stockholm. Stockholm Syndrome, where you learn to adore your captors. Uh, the world at large would be an example right now, and all these people who even pay attention to the royal families. You idiots, you've got Stockholm Syndrome. Have a look, look into it, Google it. <laughs> and you know how I know? Because the world uses nickelware, which is mimicking the royal silverware. You know, silverware is good for you, um, but nickel or nickelware, basically what we have today, you know, your metal spoons and knives, um, you know, we're pretty much copying erroneously the royals and that whole thing. So whatever that is and what that's all about, let's uh, leave that behind us. And that's why I recommend um, eating with like wooden spoons and stuff and wooden bowls and just check what you know what you're scratching like those non-stick pans with the black stuff I forgot what it's called but that uh, non-stick black stuff um, it's cancer causing it's carcinogenic and you know there's all sorts of stuff like this if you want to look deep into it look for um, salad master has a good range of 316 steel pots and pans which I discovered last night so uh, it's less corrosive so that's the idea about the 316 steel stainless steel so look into that anyway let's move into this uh, so this I'll just call it pig face you can see the scientific name there but it's annoying to pronounce <laughs> Uh, pig face is a prostrate, a plant with horizontal shoots close to the ground that may take root in the process of growth. I had to look that up. Uh, creeping succulent that has long trailing stems uh, to two meters long. And there it is. Um, which root at nodes along the stems. From these nodes the plant produces upright leafy branches. It has thick, fleshy, smooth, uh, 3.5 to 10 centimeters times 1 to 1 1.5 centimeters. Ra ra ra! You can see the flowers there. Uh, okay, so the plant produces large, striking, deep pink, purple, daisy-like flowers from October to January. This is in Australia. I'm not even sure if this grows uh, anywhere else in the world. I can't remember. I did look before. Um, we'll have a look in a second. Uh, but also can flower sp sporadically throughout the year. The plant produces a red purple berry fruit. Now this thing's growing everywhere on the Australian beaches around me here. So it's good to finally find out that you can actually eat this because I always walked past it and thought, oh, that's a pretty flower. I wonder if that's edible, you know, in the last few years while I've been walking past it. Uh, which was, so this little red purple berry fruit has been used by the native aboriginals as a food source. So that's cool. I didn't even I don't know if I've seen these little berries, but I'm going to be looking out for them now. Uh, the flesh of the fruit is said to have a taste similar to salty apples. So that's not too bad. The roasted leaves have been used as a salt substitute. 
So it's got salt. Early European explorers used the plant as an anti-scurvy treatment. <clears throat> scurvy is a disease resulting from a deficiency of vitamin C. So that means it contains vitamin C as well, which is required for the synthesis of collagen and, and binding your tissue together. The chemical name for vitamin C ascorbic acid is derived from the Latin name of scurvy, scorbutus, which also provides the adjective scorbutic, characterized by or having to do with scurvy. So the early Europeans used it as a scurvy treatment. The juice of the leaves can also be used to relieve pain from insect bites, so you can put that on insect bites. Pig face is generally a summer spring growing plant. It can be grown either from seed or cutting. I love plants that we can grow from cuttings because this is how we're going to create abundance. By, you know, if I'm growing pig face, you can come over, you can take a cutting and take it to your home. And we, we can build abundance for free. <laughs> Proper, it, it makes you laugh at the system we've got currently, doesn't it? It makes you really realize that we are indeed in some sort of psychopathic hierarchical um, dominator society system which is just rank it's rancid propagation is easiest by layering rooting horizontal stem cuttings as this is how the plant grows naturally these layers should be around 30 centimeters in length and planted leaving at at least five centimeters of the plant above the sand or soil the plant can also be grown from cut pieces or division of large plants now it is best planted in combination with spinifex and goat's foot and as it seldom provides complete cover all by itself now that got me thinking oh what's goat's foot I know spinifex but what's goat's foot let's check if goat's foot's edible and I discovered this one also grows like right next to it here on the beach and no wonder they've said plant it in combination with that and that's from some government site pig face is in the Asiosia or Physiodacea family the fig marigold family or ice plant family is a family of dicotyledonous flowering plants not sure what that means containing 135 genera and about 1900 species commonly known as stone plants or carpet weeds so let's go into goat's foot. This plant, namely the subspecies Brazilianensis, is known as Salsa da Praia in Brazilian folk medicine and is used to treat inflammation and gastrointestinal disorders. That's just from Wikipedia. And another link said it is said that the Carib Indians. Uh, so that's from America, right? Or South America? I'm not sure, but it's not in Australia. So that means these might grow over there in America where you are, Jill. Uh, incorporated these plants into derivations of certain magic potions, which were used to alleviate evil spells, which could have been just treating those things, you know. Goat's foot. Ipomia pes caprea. Not all Ipomia. Uh, species are edible. The beech vine, those considered undesirable. Da, da, da. Let's go to the link. Which one was it? Shut that one down. Yep. Here it is. It's a Google book. So this one here is a different type of Ipomea calabra, uh, a different type of Ipomea. It's called the Kulyu, and apparently that's in Western Australia, a tuberous root. And as we're going to go into in a minute, there's a new sort of uh, native fooding uh, movement happening in uh, Australia, and specifically down there with. Uh, Dr. Jeff Woodall in Western Australia and they're actually selling these at $6.95 a kilo I think <laughs> as the picture in an upcoming link will show anyway here's this beach morning glory the goat's foot 
And when I saw this, I went, oh, I have seen that. <coughs> Pardon me. I have seen that growing next to the um, uh, pig face. So let's just read this little excerpt here. <coughs> Not all Ipomoea species are edible. The beech vine Ipomoea pescaprea is among those considered undesirable, but yet edible. Uh, cooking, peeling and baking, the tuber usually did little to improve the situation or the taste, although at certain times of the year was it said to have more acceptable qualities. The center part of the thick tap root was the only part worth considering. Albeit usually stringy, bitter, irritant and generally considered quite unpalatable, only fit for use in times of famine, so another famine food, the root had the added deterrent of purgative potential. Even so, the plant was utilized medicinally and was noted to possess the following attributes mucilaginous, stomachic, astringent, tonic, alterative, diuretic, and laxative. So, you know, there's something I've been, I've been listening to this David Wolf fella. Uh, he's big in the health movement right now. And, um, you know, I like one thing he said, which was, why go for herb number 1963 instead of, you know, herb number one in any sort of herbalistic um, medicinal system? like Ayurveda or Chinese medicine or the pharmacopoeia of the uh, Shikwoto Shaman Amazon people or, you know, the Australian Aborigines. Why not go for the best herbs and you can sort of forget about most of the others unless you specifically sort of need them. It's just one thing I thought I'd add. But, um, yeah, so like, you know, it's a, it's a famine food, but there it is. If you're down at the beach and... I don't know, you're waiting for someone to get out of the surf and you're really hungry. There is some edible things around. And those flowers of the pig face, they don't taste bad at all. I haven't yet tasted the... Um, oh, actually, I think I did once taste the a little bit of the succulent uh, leaf of the pig face. Um, now that I think about it, like, I don't know, months ago or a year ago or something, just to see. <laughs> Before I even researched it, I just thought, oh, I'll have a little taste. I don't recommend doing that, it's just what I do sometimes because, well, I'm a shaman and I take psychedelics and just like the largest pharmacopoeia in the world of those Brazilian people, I, like them, use the psychedelics to a sort of uh, question the psychedelic on and, and it allows me to distill out what other plants are useful for or if they're edible and stuff just I'm not very good with it but I'm you know I've decided to do that <laughs> and um, you know that's also why you pay me and stuff too I guess because I will go out and do this sort of stuff there'll be many uh, wild foraging videos coming but um, like on on mushrooms here in the mountains and stuff but I'm just uh, still researching all of that because that's not a good area to go ahead and just try start eating mushrooms, you know, or plants. But I just do it when, you know, I've got some idea. Like, I, I think the reason I ate that little bit of the pig face leaf was someone told me a long time ago that you could um, eat it. So I thought, oh, well, I'll have a look what it tastes like. And I just sort of spat it back out. So it wasn't going to kill me because I knew it wasn't a really toxic thing. Anyway, I don't recommend doing that. <laughs> Just a story for story time. Okay, so let's go back to the page. A little bit more info from another link, which must be up here. Sorry, which one was it? AAF org. There we go, this one. So this is a link here, it's pretty in-depth, look. So people are selling these already, of this next one we're about to talk about. We're moving on to another thing. So let's finish up with this one. 
Well, let's just quickly check as medicine. Oh, what? Uh, humans, this is still on the Ipoma. Humans use Ipoma for their content of medical and psychoactive compounds, mainly alkaloids. Some species are renowned for their properties in folk medicine and herbalism. Mm, these ones here, these varieties. So not the variety we've been talking about, different varieties. The ancient Ayurvedic tonic called the Elixir of Life. It's got that in it. Other species were and still are used as potent entheogens. So in that species, Ipomea, there are some psychoactives, apparently. Now, if you get something here, there's something called uh, a horror trip, they're calling it here. That just means that it's showing you in a language that you have saved in that horrible way. It's not like it is being horrible to you. Ergoline derivatives, lysergamides, are probably responsible for the entheogenic activity. Ergoin, LSA, D lysergic acid, N hydroxyl amide, and lysergol have been isolated from that species. Anyway, let us move on. Um, so the next plant. Hold on. Uh. Yeah, there it is. There's the vine of the Ipomea calobra. That one there. What were we looking at again? Ipomea, Ipomea pes caprea. And where was that? No, don't tell me, did I delete it? Uh, so that one's the one with the tuberous root <clears throat> from that link we found. And now we're about to talk about this one. Tubers of Platasas no, deflexa. If I've pronounced that anywhere near accurately. Um, <clears throat> The Australian native edible plant industry is rapidly expanding, though most of the products are fruit-based products or spices seasoning. There is a distinct lack of native vegetable products available and a requirement for native vegetable products was identified by consumers, chefs, suppliers of native foods. They identified that their industry needed native vegetable foods that could replace traditional vegetables. That is, they require native vegetable food products to be used as staple bulk foods to replace the use of carrots, potato and other root vegetables. The flora of Western Australia contains an extraordinary number of species that form root tubers. Over 85% of 153 tuber species recorded in Western Australia occur in the southwest of the state. So there's a hot spot down there for tubers. This diversity provided an unparalleled resource from which new horticultural crops could be developed. The diversity of the flora is of international significance but had not yet not been surveyed for potential vegetable crops. So there you go, it's starting up. This is sort of part, part of the archaic revival. Getting back into nature and we're you can see the same resonances. I mean, I'm not going to talk about resonances at all in this video, but you can see the same resonances playing out over and over again. Okay. 
Jeff Woodall, a part-time research fellow at the University of WA Center for Excellence in Natural Resource Management, received $30,000 funding to develop a new industry based on a native radish. And I think I've got that link open. Yahoo something? Yeah. Here. Native to Albany. Yes. So you could forage these yourselves. If you're in Western Australia there. I'm going to maybe have a look if any of these are around here. I'm on the east coast of Australia, just under the Gold Coast in North New South Wales. So I'm a ways away from uh, southern Western Australia. That would take me days and days to drive to. So it's more commonly known as Ravensthorpe Radish or Yolk at the Bush Foods Factory and Cafe in Young Siding. <clears throat> so they have a flower like a cross between a carrot and a radish. Cool. Yeah, interesting. So it's it's good that this is coming along, that we're you know we're moving um, beyond the just regular. I don't know, five foods of the supermarket, you know what I mean? We're, we're expanding our diversity, which is awesome. And wild foods, you know, sometimes like, uh, you know, like dandelion and reishi mushroom in the wild, they contain things that uh, they don't contain when they're grown commercially. So that's why I do like wild food foraging. Because nutrition is sometimes there. Let's see if there's some more images. That might be the flower of them. Yeah, so that's that hot spot by the look of it. So it doesn't look like they're here actually. Maybe they just haven't discovered them or something, I don't know. What's this? Oh, okay. So maybe they are everywhere. Let's have a look. <sighs> so it looks like this is for just that, uh, what do you call that, the species platus, platusace. So they might be around the area. Oh wow, that's what it looks like. One of them, anyway. Let's see what that's called. And zoom in. Nope. Forget it then. Um, one second, please, if my computer will work. Here's the Wikipedia page. Let's just see what Wiki has to say. This is in another language. Awesome. So that looks like species or slack. Do you know what that means? Maybe species? Genus. Okay. So that's the genus. So the genus is everywhere, but that specific uh, Platycis deflexa looks like it's only in that southwestern. Uh, corner of Western Australia. Could look into it more, but not today. And oh, here we go, figure two. I already pre-emanated it. What page is that? Page five. 
Now, wait a minute. I've gone past it. Hello. So there's some root tubers. Target plant species, Plasticea deflexia, Ipomia colabra, Hemiodorum spicatum, Dioscorea hastifolia, stem tuber, a bulb and a root tuber and a root tuber. Awesome. So there's more. Here we go. Yeah, so it looks like, well, I can't see the other half of Australia, but it looks like they're concentrated down there near Albany. I've never been there. I drove across to Perth once, but I didn't go to Albany. It's a herbaceous perennial. I love perennials because it means you can put it in the ground and you might even be able to hand it over as intergenerational or intragenerational equity to your kids. So that's real intergenerational equity. Start, you know, when uh, old men plant trees whose shade they'll never sit in a society grows great is a saying so the aboriginal name for it is yolk for this plasticia deflexa cool a type of sort of radish carrot thing tuba looks good well there we've got a picture see you would not pick it out <laughs> Maybe it's that one, the cream flowers growing in Mali health vegetation north of Ravensthorpe. Cool. Compounds that are acutely or chronically poisonous are not expected to be found in deflexa tubers because it is known that indigenous people ate them raw and cook. Indigenous people often intentionally camped at sites where these plants grew and ate numerous tubers during their stay. So it looks safe to eat. Nice one. You can propagate it by cuttings. Nice. Looks good. They look pretty easy to grow if they're growing out there in the uh, native uh, bushlands in Western Australia. Um, let's have a look what it says here. <coughs> so they've uh, had a look at nutritional analysis for washed in distilled water. Slices one centimeter thick were cut and then dried at 60 degrees for 48 hours. And what are the results? Okay. Okay, let's move on. It's not giving me much there in the way of what I wanted to see in nutrition. Okay. So the next plant you might have even heard of, it's called wild lettuce and this is in uh, America where you are Jill. Right, I hope. Wild opium lettuce. Now first we're going to visit the Wikipedia page. So that's what it looks like there and there apparently. So it starts like that, like that and sort of goes up and spirals up like this. So from earthweeds.com well, actually let's go to Wikipedia first. So it says it's ingested often for its mild psychotropic specifically hypnotic and or sedative effects which are described being similar to opium and hence the name I guess. It is related to common lettuce uh, and is often called wild lettuce, bitter lettuce, latu virus, opium lettuce, poisonous lettuce, tall lettuce, rakutu cariumoso. It can be found locally in the southeast and east of England. In the rest of Great Britain it is very rare and in Ireland it is absent. It is also found in Punjab region of Pakistan, India and Australia where it grows in the wild. 
In North America, it has been documented as introduced in California, Alabama, Iowa, and Washington, D.C., and grows wild in other parts of the continent. So I can't wait to find out where it grows in Australia, and I will do that later after this video. It's good to know it grows here. Anyway, I did want to just cover this because um, he makes a valid point here. Earthweeds.com. It's a pretty good site. Uh, anyway, a bit of rhetoric. Something about his subscribers always sending him the same email like almost daily about this wild opium lettuce. It can be traced uh, why the interest in this uh, species, why so much interest in this species, he says it can be traced to an exaggerated entry on Wikipedia, which is what we just looked at, which if you remember correctly is not authoritative. I found so many plant mistakes in Wikipedia, I've stopped correcting them. Forager beware. And you know, this is saying um, the latex, which is called lacturum, can be derived from the extract of stems. Do do do. Oils extracts can be produced while it is used as a galacticod, a substance that increases breast milk. You shouldn't use it like that because of the sedative effects on the baby. And so this plant contains flavonoids, coumarins, and N-methyl B phenylamine. Um, which is a psychedelic sort of thing. Uh, a variety of other chemical compounds have been isolated from L. verosa. One of the compounds, lactucin, is an andonite uh, adenosine receptor agonist in vitro, while another, lactosopisrin, has been shown to act as an Acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. <laughs> All right, let's have a look at this. <clears throat> Purigenic. Purinogenic. Learning, memory, locomotor, and feeding behavior and sleep. Okay. Anyway, we're not going off to a side tangent. So don't use it as a galactagog, even though you could, um, because it might have sedative effects on the baby. <laughs> so not the best idea. Um, yeah, so good stuff from that article from this guy. Uh, from earthweeds.com, a fellow techno shaman at the end of history. <laughs> um, more information, less rhetoric though, in my opinion, which I've got to try as hard as I can in my work as well to do. But a little bit more rhetoric on the whole Stockholm Syndrome business and what we were talking about a bit earlier. So you want to, you know, we're eating with nickel wear and getting heavy metal poisoning. So you want to get immediately onto chlorella which pulls heavy metals from the body and uh, it does this in, in several ways but in one way you know chlorophyll is um, I think there's 10% chlorophyll in in chlorella which is huge and there's only 0.2 in wheatgrass or something like that so I mean it's got a really high chlorella uh, content uh, sorry a really high um, chlorophyll content and chlorophyll is only one atom uh, one molecule away from human blood hemoglobin and the difference is magnesium and iron at the center of the structure the molecular structure so it's thought that uh, the magnesiums pushed out and then things like iron and heavy metals sometimes go in there and will replace that and it'll get pulled out through urination Something like that. That's what I heard anyway. I haven't looked too deep into it. But chlorella is well known as a heavy metal detoxer and chelator, chelation technique, which is removing heavy metals. And then you want to eat with ceramic knives and wooden spoons and, and wooden bowls and, and along these lines, because we're just giving ourselves heavy metal poisoning here in our Stockholm syndrome of trying to act like the royals and their silverware using our nickelware. <laughs>
So I hope you've uh, enjoyed these videos today. Actually, I should leave these up. I've got to research more into that. I um, hope you've enjoyed the video today. And this is part of the $30 Bandit Food Plant Teaching Series. Um, there is a plant outside here which I saw um, the wallaby eating, which sort of looks similar to this. Although it doesn't have the, the razor sort of edges there, those crinkled edges, so it's probably not this same thing. So it's interesting, when you can just forage from your environment, how much uh, you can get out of that. Um, as we've seen just in this short video, and I recommend everybody looks into wild food foraging for the reasons I've described in this video and more. Because it's also fun and you're actually grounding while doing it, you know, if you're barefoot. And so you're actually re as you're doing that and healing yourself. And, you know, some people attribute all lower half of the body diseases with uh, improper grounding and you know inflammation and which is this cation positive energy creating inflammation and, and uh, like the shaman of the Amazon said in that video it's like a bright light there and uh, you know, this stops even like nerve signals and stuff I think personally from uh, thinking about this and, and listening to my body so anyway, it's a, I think it's a great idea to get your wild food uh, knowledge up because it's clear that we're at the upper echelons of this fiat counterfeited, fictionalized, fractionalized, black alliance, um, systematic, monetary, no alternative system. Um, and that, you know, that part of the system has to collapse and it will do so. And I know Jill's been following some of my other talks, like the radio interview I did the other day called Facing Ourselves, History, The Historical Hangover and the Convalescence, which means a gradual healing. And part of that gradual healing, as I was saying, is um, growing your own garden. Even the UN has a report saying the only way to sustainably feed the world, to feed all of us sustainably, is local organic farming. And wild fooding is obviously part of that because we can take these wild nutritious foods like dandelion and so on and put them in gardens and cultivate them and, and possibly make them better as well and get rid of toxins, increase the nutrient density perhaps. Um, you can do all sorts of things in cultivation. So, um, you know, it's a good idea to get your knowledge up of what is in the environment because it makes sense. We're part of this earth, you know, we're not part of the system, we're part of the earth. And the system sort of sucked everyone into it and infantilized adults and markets have swallowed humans whole. So <laughs> it's time to uh, get back to the nature, the whole nature connection thing. And, um, Get, get the many insights that nature has to teach us, but also this wild food foraging. Because, you know, who doesn't want to decrease their food spending? Or, if you start to get a real good food knowledge, foraging wild food knowledge, you can obviously, you know, get many teas, many relaxicant teas, which will stop you getting headaches and all sorts of, you know, like plantain and all sorts of things out there. Um, and you'll need to rely less, not only on the system for food, but less for the pharmaceuticals. And we have an aging population, which is relying more and more on pharmaceuticals when they don't have to, um, because it's just their lack of knowledge. If they did the research, I'm sure they could heal themselves all from nature. And this, like I said, is really the domain where knowledge really is power. And if you have a good wild food foraging knowledge and decrease your sort of spending of, you know, needing to go buy tea because you're growing plantain and this and that herb and you don't need to go buy uh, cannabis because you've got mugwort as much or, you know, you don't need to go uh, buy salad greens because you've got stuff like this uh, lettuce, wild lettuces and dandelions and whatever. 
Um, and then, you know, you've got the wild mushrooms, which are really, really good herbs, like, uh, you know, the beta-glucans and polysaccharides and the triterpenes of um, reishi mushroom, for instance. And, you know, there's all sorts of mushrooms with antibiotics in them, natural antibiotics and all this sort of stuff. So you can see that when you can spend less, then you can, on, on general fooding, you can spend more then on things like tonics, elixirs, and the thing is you'll be able to make some of your own, but while you're still learning, then you can be on the high, vibrant food and need to eat less and be in more health, and live longer and feel more vitality and etc. Um, <clears throat> just all from, you know, researching wild foods and it'll all eventually come together. You know, at the start it's hard, but then as you get to know families and, and genesis and species, you can go anywhere in the world and step off a plane and, and go, oh, hey, there's that uh, Lactuca verosa uh, opium lettuce, or there's some dandelion over there. <clears throat> and, you know, you can make your own tinctures and tonics, but in the meantime, while you're, you know, getting your knowledge up, like I can't make tinctures yet, or tinctures and, and tonics and stuff yet, I don't have much knowledge on all this yet. Um, so in the meantime, it'll give you more money to buy those things. And thus, as we're, like I mentioned earlier, every time we make an energetic movement, we're sort of voting for the type of world we want to see. Thus, you'll be voting for, you know, a better world as well. So all this from Wild Food Foraging. I'm Benjamin Kaumberg from www.consciousazine.com as in the end of magazine, consciousazine.com. And, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks a lot for donating, Jill. You really helped me out there again. Um, hopefully I'm starting to... I've paid back um, my university loan, which is, interestingly enough, interest-free, so that I bought a car again. So I'm sort of back on my feet. I went through some hard times there. And see, if I had this knowledge, the times wouldn't have been so hard. For instance, I didn't know for the last few months while I had not much food that I could eat the papaya leaves, the papaya carica, or common Australian pawpaw. You can eat that whole tree, and you can eat the leaves, and they're very nutritionist, containing 50 amino acids. And, you know, if I had known things like that months and months ago, I would have uh, been far better off and more comfortable. So I hope I've helped you guys, and there'll be more videos on wild food foraging coming in the next years and months, for sure, because I'm very interested in it. And I really, really want to, you know, walk into the universe and into abundance and out of this shriveling, shrinking, inward diversificating uh, Black Alliance system that we have on Earth. Alright, have a good day everyone. Enjoy.
Oopsie daisy. Uh, I forgot to show you one more thing besides this. This is the Conscious Zine Facebook page. We're going to overgrow the government, not overthrow them. Anyway, I wanted to show you the Archaic Revival website. Now, this is a subdomain branch off of the main tree website Conscious Zine, which means that if I ever say that about any website, that means that it's it'll be its own page in Conscious Zine, and you'll click a link and you'll enter into this, and this is a whole new website or a subdomain. So this subdomain or website is Archaic Revival. Now, I just wanted to quickly show you some of the things, you know, like building techniques, sustainable fooding. I'm just starting this up. Now, while by 2012, by the end of the Eschaton, I pretty much had the bones or the, the etching of um, Conscious Zine covered, and I just had to sort of fill it in. But the main main pages and sort of mirrored continuities of this revolution were all there by the end date of uh, what 21st of the 12th 2012. Um, and so this one I've been avoiding for a while. I've been doing a lot of uh, like psychedelic research on the psychedelic biodome Earth page in Conscious Zine and other pages. So I've been avoiding this one for a bit. But you can see I have made some sort of start. Natural Remedy, Revival, Abundant Sustainability. You know, some of these titles might change as I sort of weave through this site. Mycology, there's a big page on that. Uh, the Convalescence, on that page you can actually find the video I mentioned before. Um, I just put it on there before and it's called uh, Facing Ourselves, The Historical Hangover and The Convalescence. So that video is three hours and it's on there and I'm just talking about where we are at at, which is the end of history. Uh, mycology, it's huge, that page. Foraging. So this is what I'm going to start doing up, this foraging page. There's not much on there as of yet. Let's have a look what I've got on there. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to show you this. And this will be a page in Conscious Zine. Well, it is, sorry, already. You can just scroll down through the more menu of Conscious Zine. And um, I'll take you there in a second. And then you'll press on the enter button and you'll get to this website. There's about four subdomains on Conscious Zine, which are like branches off the main tree website that is Conscious Zine. Wild asparagus. Mugwort. Yeah, mugwort's another one. That's the closest thing I've found to cannabis, really, um, in a sort of... <clears throat> um, you know, like random herb that isn't really a psychedelic. This one's sort of an honorigan. It sort of helps with uh, generating dream states. And, you know, Terence McKenna once said, yeah, sure, they're hallucinations, but what are hallucinations, my friend? Now, I have I believe I have part of the answer, at least, um, that some hallucinations, if not you know, most of them, or all of them, you know, have to have a, a bit more of a think about it. But some of them are, uh, and the majority of them are in a language. You're seeing memories. You're seeing how you've saved things. I'd done a video the other day on Salvia Divinorum, the Diviner's Mint, which is a milligram effective, just as powerful as DMT sort of thing. Um, and... You know, in that one I was saying, you know, I found that what I saw were related to how I've saved childhood memories. And even Salvia Divinorum has a cartoonish uh, feel, also a sort of dark overtone, but a, a cartoonish feel to your visions. It's very interesting. For instance, my car seats in the middle of the night when I had one tote one night, um, it was, you're meant to do psychedelics and, and honorigans, you know, things that make you dream, like mugwort and stuff, help you with lucid dreaming and all that. These honorigans and psychedelics, you should be taking them in dark environments because it increases these melatonin and DMT natural endocrine, neuroendocrine secretions in your pineal gland. 
<clears throat> and if you want to know how to detox your pineal gland, the best way is to start using your pineal gland. Everyone's always like, oh, there's fluoride in the water. Yeah, that's terrible. And, you know, this is how you detox your pineal. Well, I'm telling you the best way to detox is by using it. <laughs> so, you know, psychedelics are definitely helpful in that area. And, um, yeah, I was going to go into something else there, but we're not going to keep talking today. That will do. So, in Lakesh stay, everybody. <laughs> you see what I did there? Yeah, pretty clever, eh? No? Don't see? Well, in Lakesh stay. In Lakesh stay. Namaste crossed with in Lakesh. <laughs> I just made that up the other the other year. And um, So, in Lakesh, I'll just quickly explain what that means to me. <clears throat> it means etched from the same field of light. You know, it means etched the same. When I say in Lakesh, to me that gives the Gnostic ring of the word and it translate into it translate directly into etched of the same. Like in Lakesh, we're etched out of the same field. And then Namaste Namaste means pretty much similar. I can see the light in you that is also in me. So I, I say now, in the Kesh day. <laughs> Alright. Enjoy your day, guys. Bye.